So wh where do I stand so that the camera is like uh, whatever? That is not a you problem. Though. This is okay? Yeah. yeah, it's wherever you wish. All right, cool. I mean, I can make a point of view. <laughs> gotcha. So everyone, um, this is my talk on Linux firewalls for competitions. Um, who am I? Um, I don't have it on here, but I am a, this is my last semester at R RIT. Um, my name's Rain. Um, and uh, I've done a fair number of competitions, both blue team and red team. And I did white team ISDS this past year. Um, when I am doing things outside of security, uh, I'm probably playing the drums, occasionally playing Counter-Strike. Uh, Z shell is the best shell. Anyway, so what I'm doing my talk on specifically with Linux firewalls is IP tables. And what is IP tables? IP tables is like a front end wrapper for uh, something called net filter, which basically exposes, um, it, it allows you to interact with the networking stack in Linux, um, and we care about it because we can basically uh, write rules that like will intercept things going on in the networking stack to, uh, you know, block, uh, drop packets or whatever. So, this is a list of IP tables commands um, that I was able to find just in SBIN, and uh, you, you're probably familiar if you've used, used IP tables with IP tables, the command. Um, but there are things like IP tables restore and IP tables save. So like IP tables save, for instance, would take your current rule set and um, uh, save it to a file. IP tables restore would take that file and put it back into your rule set. Um, but really, all of these commands come from one binary, which is something that a lot of people don't know, called X tables multi. And uh, X tables multi um, has a lot more features than even you would see in the, uh, like back here when I listed out all the different commands. Um, and here you can see sim links um, from those different commands to the X tables multi binary. So IP tables is just a sim link. It's not actually a command by itself. Um, wait, did I miss something? Yeah. So um, this is an example. Uh, if you see in the screenshot, I'm using X tables multi to call IP tables. Uh, one thing to note about this that's um, uh, in the context of competitions, if for some reason, you were to move the X tables multi binary to a different location, you might be able to break some like uh, simplistic red team automation because if red team is trying to call the IP tables binary but IP tables is moved, the sim link will break. So you could rename X tables multi to tables or something like that. And then you would have to call it in long form like that. You wouldn't be able to use the sim link, but um, you might be able to stop red team from just automatically dropping your firewalls every minute or whatever they're doing. Um, so this is the command that I typically use, uh, the flags dash NV capital L, to list out IP tables. Um, I, I like to, to add the at dash N and dash V um, because uh, it gives me better information. So the dash N is the same thing in like PS, if you have PS and then there's an N somewhere in your like P tuna or I don't remember what's the, whatever. Anyway, so. Um, the N is no resolve, so it'll give you ports and IP addresses as opposed to uh, trying to do like DNS resolution or like resolving port 80 to Nginx or HTTPD or whatever. Um, and dash L is the actual command that does the listing of all of the rules in a specific chain. If you don't pass a chain to it, then it'll just list all the rules in all chains. And I'll talk about chains next, I believe. Um, oh, no, I'll talk about chains in a little bit. First, I'm going to go uh, talk about tables. So. Um, in IP tables, uh, and by the way, stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions, because it's a lot of information. Um, but so there's five tables in IP tables. Uh, what everybody's familiar with using, if you've used IP tables before, probably is the filter table. Uh, the filter table is the default table. If you don't specify a table, that is the, that is the table that you're working in. Uh, and the filter table is for filtering out unwanted packets, so firewalls. Um, there's also uh, such, such a thing like the NAT table, which allows you to do different things, like if you wanted to actually use your um, Linux box uh, to route traffic, um, uh, you can actually do that. But I'm not, that's not what the purpose of this talk is. At some point, I'd like to give another deep dive talk in, uh, about NetFilter, which is the underlying IP tables like, uh, framework in the kernel. And uh, then I would talk about that a little more. Anyway, so. The other table that you want to be aware of is the mangle table, because it can accept everything that the filter table can accept. So um, another 
uh, trick that we used at CCDC last year to break some red team automation, um, or I think for the past couple of years, but is to put rules into the mangle table as opposed to the filter table. And since the rule sets are the same, uh, or like the rule sets can be the same, um, then the, if somebody's just running an IP tables F in their automation, you're not necessarily going to get your firewalls, firewall rules dropped. The one thing to note, though, is that if you're using the mangle table, you cannot, like, you should not put any rules in the filter table um, if you're doing the same thing, or you'll probably wind up conflicting. Um, so this is an example of using another table, so IP tables dash T mangle, and then I'm passing, uh, and this is just, it, there's no rules in here, so it's just empty. Um, what you will notice, though, is that unlike, if I go back a couple slides, we see like three chains here where it says chain input, chain forward, and chain output. Um, this has five chains. So the mangle table is actually supposed to be used for a different purpose, um, which is not super uh, relevant to anything that you're doing in a competition. But that's why it has the extra chains. And I think I'll talk about chains now. Yeah. So the five chains are pre-routing, input, forward, output, and post-routing. Um, and uh, the only ones that we really care about for the sake of firewalls is input and output. Um, and like I said before, the mangle table supports all of those table, uh, all of those chains rather, um, whereas the, the filter table is only going to support input, forward, and output. Still, though, we only care about input and output. So this is a table that I pulled off of a, a DigitalOcean article that I read a while back. To, like, they have a pretty nice tutorial series if you've never been to DigitalOcean. Um, but this table basically kind of shows you the order in which rules would be evaluated if you're putting things into different tables. Uh, again, we're not going to delve too much into this, but it is very useful to know. Um, what, I, what you can see based on this table is that um, or if, if you kind of understand how to read the table, and I have another graphic that kind of helps clarify that. Um, so like the raw um, pre-routing uh, chain within the raw table would get executed first, but all pre-routing, uh, uh, like all different tables, everything in the pre-routing chain would get executed first. Then you would move on to the next chain, and then you would uh, figure out which table gets executed next. So like the first thing that would be executed is raw pre-routing, then mangle pre-routing then NAT pre-routing, then, and then don't worry about routing decision. But then you move on to input, and the next thing you're looking at is input mangle, if that kind of makes sense. So this is another way to visualize that. Um, and really, if I can, not sure if you can see my mouse, but like, you, I just wanted to show this graphic to show like all pre-routing would get executed first, and then based on the rules in the pre-routing table, you either move on to the mangle table, uh, mangle input table, or the mangle forward table, or whatever. Um, so. Any questions so far? Because this is a very confusing, even for me. OK. So uh, this is an example of flushing a rule from a table using the TAC capital F command. Um, so I just, uh, in this image, I have, I wrote a rule, and then I'm just displaying that it's there, and then I remove the rule, and then I'm just showing it again. And this is also an example uh, where you see I'm doing IP tables dash NV capital L space input. I'm just displaying the input chain so that I can fit everything onto the screenshot. But so anyway, um, and uh, this is very important. Um, there is such a thing with chains called default policy. Um, if you if you see where it says chain input and then it says like pol policy accept 14 packets or whatever. Um, what you're seeing there is a default policy if there are no rules. So the standard default policy, if you don't have any IP tables rules written, is accept. So you're going to allow everything. But you can set that policy to drop, in which case, if you have no rules, everything will get dropped for that chain. Um, yes? That's like a good example of when you would want to use drop versus when you would want to use accept. Uh, that's coming up in the next two slides. Yeah. So um, in competitions, there's two scenarios. Um, if you're in the cloud, meaning that you have a remote uh, machine that you're connecting to, um, you definitely always want to keep your policy as accept. The reason being, um, let's say that Red Team has some automation that's going to drop your firewall rules, and you have um, you know, the, your policy set to drop. Then as soon as they drop all the firewall rules that are allowing you to SSH in or you know, VNC in or RDP or whatever, well, not RDP on Linux, but um, 
if that gets dropped, then all of a sudden you have no connection. So you will stop scoring on the box and you will not be able to access it. And that would put you in a very precarious position. You'll probably have to request a box reset, which is, yes? I don't believe policy, isn't policy persistent across reboots? I could be wrong. I thought, pol I thought the default policy was, but I, it is? I believe the policy is persistent. So that's, that's why it's really dangerous. Um, yeah, uh, that, that is a, that's actually something that I meant to mention. For the rest of the IP tables rules that you write, um, if you do, for some reason, uh, lose access to your box because you've written a bad IP table rule, you can restart. With policy, though, you don't have that luxury, I believe. I, again, I could be wrong because I think it's persistent across reboots. So uh, contrary to the cloud, if you have physical access to a machine, so your um, uh, this is what would be considered your local network or you know whatever um, in competitions typically there'll be some kind of like business cloud and then there'll be like the local machines or whatever as long as you have physical console access to it you can set your default policy to drop because what will happen is let's say that red team um, is trying to drop your firewall rules to get back in well you you'll stop scoring when um, all of your firewall rules are dropped and uh, your default policy is set to drop, but red team is not able to use that opportunity to get back in. Um, you can, you'll know within a scoring check at the latest, um, and then you can you know, look for that automation and re-execute re, um, your IP table rules. To do that, um, do you need to have other plugs, or is it any type of plugs? <laughs> oh, uh, yes, it has to be leather gloves. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, if you don't wear leather gloves to your competition, you're not doing it right. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, they can get your fingerprint and then uh, it's over. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the basic syntax of a rule. Um, so. I have a lot of information here. Um, I do apologize. Uh, I was trying to make these slides uh, good as a resource after I'm done presenting. But basically, at the, the screenshot up at the top uh, shows the IP me writing a rule to allow all SSH. And so to break down the command, we have IP tables and then the dash capital A flag. And what that means is append. Um, there are also dash i for insert and dash r or dash d for delete. Um, we don't really need to worry about those because in the context of a competition, you should be putting your IP tables rules in a script uh, so that you're basically flushing and re-adding to the table, in which case you can always just append. So you don't need to insert in the middle. The way IP tables rules get executed uh, is just moving down the line. So if you put a rule that's going to, um, if you put a rule higher up in the chain than, uh, or if you put like a drop rule higher up in the chain, then, and then you have an accept rule, that's not going to work. Uh, so you would have to um, make sure that they're in the proper order. Yes. I'm not explaining that super well. But anyway, so uh, you want to append to a different chain. So in this case, we're appending to the input chain. And then I'm using the protocol TCP. And the different protocols that you can have there are either TCP, UDP, ICMP. Um, you can put all. I don't typically recommend writing an all rule because there's not a circumstance I can come up with that that would be good in a competition. Um, but um, so depending on what protocol you're focusing, or layer four protocol, that, that would be what you would put there. Um, and then we have dash dash D port, uh, and that's your destination port. So whatever port the traffic is destined for. So in this case, SSH is destined for port 22. Um, and then dash J means jump. Uh, which is a little confusing, but basically what that means is once uh, you've gone through the logic of this rule, then jump to either accept or drop is pretty much the only target that we would care about in a competition. There are other things. Uh, you can jump to something that's called reject, which is a little bit different. Um, and then like with ICMP, you can jump to different like ICMP, like uh, prohibited error codes or whatever. Um, but for the context of a competition, you just want accept and drop. So this is a little bit more of an advanced rule. Um, it's, and it, there's some more syntax below. But basically, what I've added here, we've got the dash dash s port and the dash dash d port. Or dash dash, uh, yeah, dash dash s port, which is source port, so wherever your traffic is originating from, as opposed to 
where it's like what it is destined to. And then we have dash s and dash d, which is source and destination. Um, and the source and destination is where the traffic is actually coming from, not from a port level, but from like the actual IP address. Or it could also be a host name or a, I believe you can also pass it a, like an IP range. Um, but anyway, so you specify that and then you, um, and that restricts uh, where you're making connections from. So if you want to connect to the cloud, you can allow SSH from your, if you, if you can figure out where you're coming from, you can allow SSH from your subnet to go to the cloud and then Red Team wouldn't be able to SSH in. Um, that's not typically a luxury you're afforded in a competition, but um, anyway, so, and then if you do that, you can, um, you're making sure that Red Team can't just bombard you with different IP addresses. Anyway, so the rest of the rule, um, we have dash M state, uh, dash dash state equals established and related. Uh, and what that means, uh, that you're, you're using the state module. There's a couple of different modules that you might want to use either State or contract do basically the same thing. State is older and available on more distros, whereas contract is newer, but it has a few more features. Anyway, and then you also have uh, multi-port, which allows you to specify multiple ports in a single IP tables rule. Um, but so those are the modules you'd probably use. The state module, though, is very important because it allows you to uh, make sure that if you have traffic coming inbound, only tra traffic um, that's already, or, or, like if you already have an established connection, then the traffic will be allowed back out of the same port. Otherwise, uh, you don't want to allow that. So in this case, what's kind of confusing about this rule is you're typically going to have, if you're connecting to a database that's external, you would originate the traffic from your box and send it to port 3306, which is MySQL, and then um, when the traffic comes back, that's, an, that's already an established connection. So because of that, you're going to allow the response back. Um, if not, if somebody was just trying to originate a connection from that remote database server um, that wasn't already established, they wouldn't be able to do it because um, it's a new connection. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? And this is, oh, so this is actually the, state, the slide I wrote on connection tracking. So that's just more about that. Um, in your IP tables rules that you're going to write for competition, typically what you'll have is a blanket um, allow outbound for established and related. Um, because in that case, what you're doing, basically the only time that traffic could go outbound is if it, you've already allowed it inbound. Um, and this just makes it easier for writing your rules. Uh, I know Micah has a little bit of disagreement on this particular um, point. but uh, so. What was that? OK, whatever. Yeah. So I'm not even ta I'm talking about specifically the, the connection tracking for outbound, though. You like to put it on every rule. Uh, that's, that's what you did last year. Oh. oh, no, no, no. That's what I'm saying. You like to write one for every rule as opposed to that. Um, but my argument and a couple of other people's argument is that the only time that connections can go outbound, even if they're established and related, is if they're somehow established, which means that there has to be an inbound rule, right? Yeah. No, I know. Uh, Micah, Micah does some weird bash things where it makes it very easy to write that rule set, but uh, it's hard for a lot of people to read. I know Jack was of that opinion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the two, the two states, by the way, are established and related. Established, most people are familiar with. If you, like, it's the t, like a TCP session that's been established. Um, it, but related, what that means, it's like if, you have, um, if you're familiar with how FTP works and you have the like, control port and then you also have the data port, um, if you're already sending commands over port 21 and then you want to send information over port 20, which is the data, um, then uh, you would that would be a related state connection. So now I have a couple of screenshots of the IP, an IP tables uh, rule set that I wrote. So to start off, it is a bash script. Uh, what I like to do to make it easier for writing is set IP tables to the variable IP. Um, and then here, because we are also using, um, you also have to make sure that you're keeping in mind IPv6, which is a different, like a different set of tables 
Um, you need to use the IP6 tables command, or it's X tables multi space IP tab IP6 tables. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm flushing it first, and I'm also flushing the different tables in, I in the IP6 tables, and then I'm just setting their uh, setting them to drop. So I'm doing IP tables um, on the input chain and the output chain, just no matter what, drop. Um, and so then what I do, uh, using, again, I set the IP tables to IP. So it's just a little bit easier to type. And I'm flushing the rules. You always want to do that, because during the competition, you're probably going to be amending the script and then rewriting, rerunning your rules. The easiest way to do it is to just flush every time and then uh, reapply. So. Um, I do IP-F um, to flush my rules, and then I do IP-Tables-X, which I didn't actually put on a slide. But what that does is it deletes all non-default chains. So you have the standard five chains in IP-Tables. You can theoretically add more. Um, so if Red Team's trying to do something cheeky, that'll just wipe that away. Uh, and you do that for uh, as many tables as you want. Um, I typically, like in, in the actual competition, I flush all five tables. So, and then you can allow uh, you, what you definitely want is to allow all <coughs> loopback in and out. Uh, so the dash I flag and the dash O flag, that's inbound, inbound interface and outbound interface. Um, and you want to allow a loopback because a lot of things will communicate um, for localhost otherwise while you're, while you're on your own machine. Um, if anything needs to communicate locally, it won't be able to. Um, and then this is the, the blanket rule that I was talking about before to allow outbound connections. Um, where you're allowing only outbound connections that are established or related. Um, and then here's an example, moving further in the script, of allowing all SSH connections. Uh, so we're not restricting based on anything. Um, so I'm just, uh, and I kind of broke down this rule before when I was showing syntax, but we've got the, um, it's TCP and it's destination port 22. So, and then the outbound version of that is taken care of back with the rule at the bottom um, because anything, you're like whenever somebody tries to make an SSH connection to you, then it will be established. So uh, then the next rule is a little bit more complicated. And what this is is the uh, allowing remote MySQL from a specific IP address. And again, I also went over that in the more advanced rule. Um, oops. But uh, basically, uh, here I'm restricting so that uh, traffic, you can, you, traffic has to originate from you. So you're sending traffic out on port 3306 to um, the IP address 10.0.0.1, and then 10.0.0.1 will have to respond to you, but it will only be able to respond to you if it's coming from the port 3306 and it's established, or, and the connection state is established and related. Um, and then the most important part of any IP tables rule set that you write, or the script that you write, is you have to make sure you have a default drop, because otherwise you've written all of these allow rules to make sure that you're allowing um, specific connections, but then you're not actually dropping the traffic. And if that's the case, then um, you're uh, not doing any, you're not actually enforcing any firewall rules, right? Because you're still allowing everything. Um, and then this last piece is sleep uh, for five seconds and then run IP tables F. So effectively, what you're doing there is you're allowing your rule set to exist for five seconds for testing purposes, and then you're going to flush. The reason that you want to do that is let's say that you're writing these IP tables rules on a cloud box and You've written the IP tables rules, and then you're doing this over SSH. Well, if you, if you messed up the SSH rule somehow, then you're going to get dropped from your connection to the box. But um, with this, basically what this allows you to do is you run this command, and then you sit there and you, you figure, can I run commands, or can, you know, like, can I interact with my shell over SSH while, while the sleep is going on? And then if you can, great. Well, then you can just comment that out and rerun your IP tables rule set and uh, you're good to go. If not, then you can go back and figure out where did I go wrong and try it again. And the ampersand, just for anybody who doesn't know, uh, uh, forks that so that you can interact with your terminal while you're uh, sleeping. And the, this, I think this is the final slide. Um, the, was that? It's in advance. Yeah. So th this is a very um, good strategy for um, uh, competitions. This is it, the IP tables rule set that I wrote um, uh, on our, uh, like the paper that we got to take the CCDC for in preparation for CCDC. You might rec recognize the name of these boxes from Joe Graham and Anthony Critelli's uh, talk when they were, uh, speaking of Anthony Critelli, um, uh, when they gave a talk on the CCD, CCDC infrastructure. Uh, this was the rule set that I wrote out. And basically what this is doing 
is allowing you to um, only allow SSH from a specific box. So in the case of the competition, we chose the one box that had SSH as a scored service. And so basically, the, the idea with behind a bastion host or a jump box is that you SSH from your local, local network to that jump box, and then only from the jump box are you allowed to go to other places. So that way, um, there's one point that you have to defend against Red Team um, to stop them from being able to just randomly SSH into your boxes. So um, I highly recommend this as a strategy. Uh, it works really well. Um, and once again, you can see I, I, uh, when I wrote that, I had my sleep and IP tables chef. Um, you have to make sure that you do allow SSH into the jump box itself because you, you, the idea is that you're allowing SSH in from anywhere to that jump box. Um, and then this, this rule is rather irrelevant, although actually it might be worth mentioning. Um, so before when I was saying feel free to flush all your tables, the one thing you want to be careful of, um, so the NAT table does some special things like port forwarding. So basically what that does is it allows... Uh, it allows your box to listen on port, like in this case it was 443, but then the application itself was listening on a different port, so it forwards that traffic. Um, and one of the services that we were using last year had, uh, like, by default, listened on port 8443, so then, and then it automatically populates the NAT table with a rule to do that. So if you just flush the, the tables before looking at them, you might flush a rule like that, which I did at CCDC. Yes? What's the benefit of port forwarding? Uh, so I don't think there really is one. In theory, the idea behind it is that um, the service is not doesn't have to run as root because it's not listening on a um, standard port. But there are ways that you can just allow the service to listen onto that port without, like, the www data user is allowed to listen on port 80 and 443 without um, being root. So, and that www data is the HTTP, HTTPD uh, user, I guess, right? Yeah, so. And that was a lot of information. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Yes? Uh, why is the uh, IP table or like the finish towards caps lock? Towards caps lock? Yeah. That is a great question. I don't know. Uh, I mean, in general, IP tables, in my opinion, the, it, the, one of the hardest things about learning IP tables is the syntax that they use, in my opinion, is not intuitive at all. Um, uh, they Typically, a, the capitalization either refers to a chain or um, not a table. Yeah, I, 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 it would be a chain or a policy, I guess, or like, so your target. So, uh, so back when, when I said like you have to jump like just J drop, drop is your target. Um, and I didn't go into those, but there's like five or six different kinds of IP tables targets. Um, yeah, so th those are the things that are typically capitalized. A lot of the flags are capitalized. There's also a lot of duplicated flags where uppercase and lowercase do different things. So like dash uppercase P is default policy, dash lowercase P is IP or like layer four protocol. So, Micah, you had a question? So I think biting the bullet is better. And the reason that I think that is because in a lot of cases, UFW doesn't, it <laughs> doesn't do everything that you want it to do. Like it, it'll, it'll allow simple things. But as soon as you get into anything a little bit more complicated, I would say that learning IP tables is better. Not to mention the fact that UFW is not universal. right? Like I, IP tables is pretty much uh, universal across all Linux. Not Unix, but Linux, um, whereas um, UFW is pretty much a Ubuntu thing, and then I think Debian also supports the package if you want to download it. And that's also kind of weird because UFW is a wrapper for IP tables, which is a wrapper for NetFilter. Whereas IP, so, I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, the, I would say that it, the syntax is kind of hard to get used to. So that's why I was trying to make the slides rather verbose, um, was so that if you want to go back and look at these slides, hopefully um, I did a good job of like, explaining what each flag is supposed to do and why you would want to use it. Anything else? How important is this to the competition? Firewalls are integral to the competition. They are what will win or, like, win or lose a competition for you. Because at the end of the day, um, 
either, you know, like red team, they can have all kinds of crazy malware that like they could possibly dream up on your box. But if they can't talk out um, from your box back to whatever command and control they have, they're they're doing pretty they're in a pretty bad spot. Yes. Now, do, do keep in mind there are ways to circumvent, even if you have a perfect firewall rule set, there are certain things such as raw sockets and uh, other magical things that you can use to do that. So just keep that in mind. Um, but this will prevent anything that's going to be not super sophisticated. Or e anything that's even fairly sophisticated can be prevented with good firewall rules. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, never mind. Any final questions?